Don't fulfill your potential. Fulfill your purpose. Yeah. Mm. All throughout our childhood, we're told to fulfill our potential, but that's actually not a smart thing to do when, when wow. your focus is Jesus, because Jesus had all the potential in the world. He could have been the Caesar. He could have been a Roman soldier. He could have been whatever he wanted. But when he climbed up on that cross and gave up his now. life, what was his word? It is finished, not his potential, his purpose. Tell us a little bit of your story. Get us, get us caught up. It's really an amazing thing that God's doing here. Well, um, thank you for this interview. I believe this <laughs> is going to be fun. Um, and for everybody that does not know, my name is Michael Todd. Um, I'm six, one and a half. I'm black. <laughs> I have uh, three and a half children married to the most amazing woman in the world. Her name is Natalie. When's the fourth coming? Fourth is coming in June, okay. and it's four and no more. We're done. <laughs> okay. Um, the shop shut down. <laughs> but um, I am a product of listening to God, obeying, and using what God has placed in my hand at the moment and doing the next thing I feel like God has called me to do. Um, I am a pastor today, but if you would have told me a decade ago that I would be a pastor, I would have told you to your face, you're a liar <laughs> and you need to get away from me because I had no idea what God's plan was for my life. I knew I was gifted in music and that's what I did. I was a music producer and I had worked on major things and done stuff with famous people and was building this thing. And it was almost like God was like, yeah, that was where I was starting you to give you some of the tools that I needed you. But now I need you to bring all of that and I need you to bring it here. And um, I started out as the sound man in this church. I was the sound man um, in what, at that time was called Greenwood Christian Center. And um, I was just serving faithfully. I was getting paid, I believe, $35 a week to uh, help run sound. And I went from being the sound man at this church to the lead pastor in four and a half years, walking alongside of our founding pastor, um, Pastor Gary McIntosh and his beautiful wife that had been um, in Tulsa um, for over three decades. And, and that's why I always say that what God is doing in your life is a continuation of what he was doing in somebody else's life. There you go. He's never just doing it in you. He was doing um, this, this moment that I'm living out right now. It was with my parents who moved here 30 years ago, along with the founding pastor of Greenwood 30 years ago to help another ministry that was prominent in our city um, be formed. And I was born into that. And, and I just think about all of the conferences I was at and all of the meetings and prayer meetings and all these things when I wasn't paying attention, but I was in the atmosphere that was going to produce my future. And um, I begin to look at all of the moments where I was the um, junior and senior class president and the first black Mr. Edison and I was leading in a multi-ethnic school and I was raised in a multi-ethnic church and all of these different things and I would stand up in front of um, um, my entire student body and make them laugh and be the guy who did all the pet rallies and stuff. And I was like, I don't have any formal training. God said, I've been training you this whole time. Yeah. And I don't know who needs to hear this right now, but at the moment you're in, like the moment you're in, it doesn't look like God's doing anything, but what seems mundane and what seems normal and what seems like you do just because you're there, that may be the very thing that God is using to shape you, to train you and, and to make you into who he's called you to be. And Matt, Lori, I am a product of moments where God used where I was to shape me, and then he put me in a foreign environment. I knew church from playing drums and being a part of plays and stuff like that, but leadership, oh no. And I was on the fast track in leadership in this church where within a four year period, not because I wanted the platform, not because I wanted to be anything, I was just serving where I was at. And um, I went from the sound man to I started working with the youth. And I went from working with the youth and doing a, a youth ministry called Soul Fly, Sold Out Free Life Youth. And our mascot was a fly. Um, I don't know where we fully got that from, but it worked. And we had thousands of young people coming from all over the city on Sunday nights. And I would do what I do on Sunday mornings, I would do to them. 
in a season where God was allowing me to develop. And that's why I always tell people like the dark, the, the not being seen, the, the nobody knowing who you are is on purpose because the dark room is for development. Mm. You just think about it. You guys know that, that um, right now all of us have cell phones and if we want to take a, a high quality picture, we can pull out our cell phone right now and take it and have it. But just a few years ago to get a high quality picture, you would have to take the picture and then you would have to, on the instant cameras, roll it back. Mm -hmm. And then after you took all your pictures, you had to take the film out and take it to a place that had this one specific area, a dark room. Because hmm. the dark room was for it to actually be developed. And in um, my life, people think that I'm somebody that just came out of nowhere, but I've been in the dark room for a decade. Come on now. I've been... I've been in a place with no exposure that God was developing me. See, see if, you, if you get too much exposure too soon, it ruins that image. And I think the thing that in our generation where people are popping up, it seems like some people are popping up, but anybody who's an overnight success, I always try to figure out mm. how long have they been in the dark room? Yeah. Because the dark room is where God develops your character. The dark room is where God keeps working those things out of you that, that you still can be used on a platform, but you know are nasty behind the scenes. The dark room are the places that God begins to say, change that. Stop hanging with those people. And I was in that season, and, and, and then God decided for some reason to elevate me to being the executive pastor of our church. And I said, <laughs> I, I literally looked at our, our, our um, pastor, and I said, what does that mean? He said, I don't know, but we'll figure it out together. Wow. <laughs> And he started inviting me into business meetings and to make day-to-day -day decisions and to help plan sermon series and to do all of this, these different things in our, our, our church that was planted in the hood of Tulsa because our pastor had a vision to come there. Um, Tulsa, though it's known for a lot of amazing things, it has a very dark um, history. And um, right now it's 2000, I mean, 2021. This is the hundred year of um, the race massacre that happened in Tulsa. If you look it up, the Tulsa race massacre, race riots, you can look that up. And um, there was a huge division racially in our city. And if you don't know this, um, our, our pastor um, that founded this church is a white gentleman. And he felt that God told him and his wife, Pastor Debbie in 1999, to go to North Tulsa and reverse the curse. And that whole thing started on Greenwood Street. Come on now. So they named the church Greenwood Christian Center. And 16 years, they poured their life into this. And then they felt at some point, I was supposed to be the one to help them with this journey. And it's just funny how God works, that they begin this process. I become the executive pastor of the church, and I'm about to leave to go to New York, LA, to follow my passion in music. Because mm -hmm. I felt like, okay, I've done the church thing. I've helped my parents in ministry. I've helped them in ministry. Now let's do something else. And I came into that meeting and they said, um, we don't believe we have the vision for where this church is supposed to go next. I said, wow, that, that seems like something you really need to pray about. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and they said, we think you do. And I said, oh, oh no, no. I said, I'm, no, 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 I'm sorry if I misled y'all this whole time <laughs> I've been serving. Like, I know I'm not supposed to be a pastor. I, I, my words verbatim was, I don't even like people that much. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I said to them. And he said, but don't worry. It's a five-year plan. This is 2014. Don't worry. It's a five-year plan. And I was like, okay, good. I, I might have time to go back to seminary or just or try to figure out some things. This is September 2014. I became the lead pastor February 1st, 2015. Lord have mercy. Six months later, I become the lead pastor. And all I know, Matt and Lori, is that there was a divine grace that came over my life on February 1st, 2015, when me and my wife stepped into that role. And we stepped in knowing that we didn't know anything except God was with us. And when we doubled down that God was with us, we said, whatever comes, whoever goes, whoever leaves, we're gonna do what God's called us to do. And um, at that point, we were a church of about 300 people planted in the hood of Tulsa in a converted grocery store, and we decided to be faithful. And in that moment of being faithful, um, we were met with all kinds of challenges. Anything that a regular church planner would go through, we believe you're the man for the job, but the wrong man for our family. Yeah. 
people leaving, people going, people voting with their dollars. And I had heard God say one thing to me so clearly. He said, you need to buy new cameras. Now, I know that must be the most unspiritual thing that most people would, would, would say. And people left the church over. My goodness. But I stood up in front of our church and I said, I, with my knees shaking, and I was like, I know I heard God that we're supposed to buy new cameras. I know we're supposed to raise $80,000 to be able to believe God. And this was my faith at the time. And there are people that sit in the audience right now that were there when we did this. And by faith, we raised that $80,000 and we got new cameras. And I was like, now what, God? <laughs> and he said, I just want you to put them on YouTube. And so from the time I became the pastor, we just put my messages on YouTube. And only about, you know, 100 people would watch it. Most of them were my mom who's sitting in the front row right now. Mom, thank you for you and your prayer group watching. <laughs> but it, it, I mean... There was no traction, there was no plan, there was no marketing, it was just obedience. And I pastored our church. And in 2017, something miraculous happened. It, it, was, it was a moment where God challenged me to be obedient and do less. I can remember it like it was yesterday, 2015 and 16. We saw a little bit of growth, uh, but it was nowhere near um, what we, we planned on and what we thought God was going to do. In 2017, after having our best year ever at the time, God said, you need to do less. You need to find the pace of grace. I was like, what in the world are you talking about? A huge message yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah I love it, this. The I was like, grace. I, I, I'm, I'm only doing a little bit compared to them and them and them. And God said, no, for what I've called you to do. You see, so many times we compare our, our seed to somebody else's harvest. Yep. And we start trying to compare where we are in this moment to what God is trying to do in our lifetime. And God said, you're doing too much. You need to slow down. And I'm sitting there on December 5th, um, 2017, and I'm with some of our staff members in what we call the Stratop at the time. And... Um, Tim Ross, um, our oversight pastor, stands up and says, you know what, God has been so good to you guys in the past two years. Most churches have never seen this amount of growth. And I'm sitting there thinking like, we ain't done nothing. This is nothing. And he said, but it's unsustainable. You need to slow down. And the word God gave me was stride, S-T-R-I-D-E, which means to walk in long, decisive steps in an intentional direction. Wow. And I begin to search all of the scriptures about Jesus walking everywhere. And you don't, I mean, if I was a son of God and I, I could stand outside of time and I knew there would be Teslas and I knew there would be horses and I knew there would be Segways, I would have at least had some technology to help me get from city to city. But where you find Jesus is he always walked everywhere. He walked everywhere. And as I begin to search, I mean, at least the only time we find him on a horse is at um, the, the, the end of his, of, of his um, ministry and the idea. But the only animal we find him on is a donkey, yeah. Yeah. which is a walking animal. And I begin to think about why did Jesus do that? It's because if you had three years to do everything you were called to do to turn the world upside down, our culture would tell us hustle, grind make it, double it, 10 exit, all of these different concepts. But Jesus walked. He found the pace of grace. He was graced for a specific pace. It allowed him to walk with others that if he would have ran everywhere, they would have missed moments that on, miracles man. happened. Beautiful. They, would have, they would have not been able. It all sums up in the moment where the man comes to Jesus and says, my daughter is dying. Will you come? And Jesus says, I'm coming. But he walks. How do we know he walks? Because a woman who had been suffering with the issue of blood for 12 years was able to reach out and touch him. She was in pain and he was going in a pace that he, that he was slow enough that she could touch him. And I know the, the man was like, yo, hurry up. Like culture is telling us, hurry yeah. up. Yeah. My dream is dying. My, 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 my ambition is dying. And, and it's trying to hurry us. But God went at a pace that he knew he was graced for because he was going to heal the girl who was 12 years old and the woman who had been suffering for 12 years in the same day because he now. had found the pace of grace. Beautiful. I'm getting excited already on. on this thing right now. <laughs> what culture is telling us to do is strive. S-T-R-I-V-E. Use all your effort and energy. Use all your networking. Smooth your way to the top. And God says, hey, promotion comes from me. And when we made that decision to cut back in 2017, 
it wasn't with some promise on the line. It wasn't with like, if you do this, then I'm going to do this. God was challenging my heart. It was almost like he was saying, I just want to know that you trust me and that you'll obey me no matter what I tell you to do. In 2017, August, I preached a sermon series called Relationship Goals. And Relationship Goals did the same thing as every other sermon that I did. The 50 to 100 people with my mom and her group watched it and that was it. Yep. December, God said for me to do less, stride. And I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs, December 22nd, 23rd, a young lady on Twitter, and I didn't even have a Twitter at the time, um, she posted a two minute clip of relationship goals that we had done a few months earlier and two million people watched it in 48 hours. <laughs> and in that moment, I still didn't know what was happening. Me and my wife, I remember, we're at P.F. Chang's, <laughs> like eating, and I'm getting 10,000 Instagram followers a day. And I'm like, what is going on? And Black Panther had just came out, and so I thought they <laughs> thought I was Michael B. Jordan or somebody like that. But I, I mean, it's just all of these different things. It's because we didn't even have all of the technical things you needed to be a professional ministry. We didn't have a working website. And all we had when these people were like, I wanna see this whole message. I wanna know what happened. All we had when they searched in Google, Michael Todd, relationship goals, all that came up was YouTube. And all the videos for two and a half years that we had put on YouTube. And, and those they, cameras. That those God cameras told that God told me to buy. <laughs> that those people. That, that the people the walked page. away from us with. <laughs> and at that watching. moment, wow. at that moment, God took my obedience step yeah. almost three years earlier and used it as the catalyst for getting this message to the world. Mm -hmm. And people begin to watch relationship goals and binge watch it like Netflix. There's eight parts to it. And we went from 1,800 YouTube subscribers to like 200,000 in 60 days. And things started happening and people started calling. And when I was in my 21 days of prayer and fasting, because um, that just happened um, at that moment, I was praying and God said, take two engagements a month this year. And I said, two engagements a month? I said, last year I only had four people ask me to come speak anywhere. God knew the pace that I needed to go at to be graced for what he called me to. And within about six months, 1,800 um, speaking engagements requests came in from all over the world. And we ended that year doing less than 12 engagements because I had learned from this moment the value of the pace of grace. Okay. I love it. It's, it <laughs> that segment was a world record, by I the way, because you gave a, a testimony Perfect. and preached two different sermons <laughs> inside of it. <laughs> And by the way, if you just tuned in, Michael Todd is giving us the storyline, the behind the scenes version of what God does to someone that is faithful in the little so that he can make you steward over much. And, and we're, we're here you know, at this amazing Transformation Church we're not actually in the church, we're in the <laughs> lobby of the church, okay? So this would be an impressive church, okay? Wow. The, the church we're gonna show you by all sorts of, you know, we got some B-roll and we've got all that kind of stuff. And this entire program, we're going to be kind of featuring really an amazing story, Michael. And by the way, we've been after you for a while, okay? <laughs> so I'm gonna well, say- I'm glad I'm to say, be here. This okay. is a God moment. I don't know why it's not much bigger on the front, but it, this is a New York Times number one bestseller book. All to the glory of okay. God. So I'm not, sure, I'm not sure we're talking about anything that's ever been done before, Michael. And it feels like you're halfway through the story because now you got to kind of tell us about what we're here, you know, and what's happening here because all of a sudden we started hearing about a young man who had blown up the internet and and then all of a sudden ended up buying the convention center in town and okay that's a that we're here to get this story <laughs> because we want more Michael Todd's mm -hmm. to come out and buy their convention centers mm -hmm. we want we want this to happen globally yeah. we want what's happening to you and you're almost telling us how to do it so the way to do it is to not want it like like that's the difference between what we have and what we were going for. I was going for God and I got this. 
And, and, and I think that's what people, they go for the this and, and hope God comes. Yeah, hope God bless you. <laughs> Ho hopefully this was you, God, yeah. but I'm going for this. I'm going for the social media fame. I'm going for the big church. I'm going to break all of the records for a church planner. I'm going for the business records. And I never went, I, you will not find anywhere written down that I want to be a, a pastor that does this and that does this. I never wrote that down. I, God, I just want to be in your will. Yeah. I, want, I, want to, I want to know your purpose for my life. Like, I need to know what God has called me to do. And, and this is the thing that I tell people all the time. Don't fulfill your potential. Fulfill your purpose. Yeah. Mm. All so throughout good. our childhood, we're told to fulfill our potential. But that's actually not a smart thing to do when, wow. when your focus is Jesus because Jesus had all the potential in the world. He could have been the Caesar. He could have been a Roman soldier. He could have been whatever he wanted. But when he climbed up on that cross and gave Come up his now. life, what was his word? It is finished. Not his potential, his purpose. And I don't know who needs to hear this, but you're in the middle of something right now and you've been trying to fulfill all of these things that you're good at and God said, it may be good, but is it me? Is it a good thing or a God thing? And many times that means you were gonna have to divorce what our degree says, what our family has told us, what we've spent all this time doing. It's because my purpose may be raising those kids. My purpose may be writing a book that only 300 people are, are able to read, but those 300 people then go on to turn the whole world upside down. My purpose may be serving in that local church in an area that doesn't get the platform, but is able to instill in to people the true love of God. It's not about the thing that provides the greatest platform. It's the thing that God looks at and says, that's what I purposed you for. And for me, my story, I'm still discovering who I am as I walk in purpose. I don't know where I'm gonna be five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, because I never saw any of this. I never wanted any of this, but when it's given to me, now it is my responsibility to steward over it. You're following a, uh, a pathway here, yeah. and, and God gave you, you know, something to write down. So yeah. explain what this is and how you were kind of showing it to us a little earlier. So I don't feel like I'm doing something that's great. I feel like I'm a part of something that God's doing that is great. Mm -hmm. And um, when I became the pastor with my beautiful wife, Natalie, on uh, February 1st, 2015, 37 days later, I'm in my quiet time, probably crying, asking God, what am I doing? <laughs> like, like, help me. Help and, me. <laughs> and, and all I hear is write this down. And I pull out my computer and this document is what I wrote down. Mm. And the first thing I said is the Spirit Bank Event Center will be Transformation Church. My goodness. And I, 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 I tell people all the time, God um, tells us to write the vision and make it plain, and he'll take it even with mistakes. I smelled <laughs> transformation wrong. <laughs> if you can see it, I, I, I had poor uh, editing skills, but I, I just tried to get an image of what God said, and I leave it like this to let people know all you have is all you need. Yeah. God's not looking for pro perfection. He's looking for progression. There you go. And I wrote down these things that the Spirit Bank Event Center will be Transformation Church and all these other things. And it was March 9th, 2015. At the bottom, you guys can see it. It says 7.29 a.m. in Bella's room. And I wrote this down 30-something days after I became the lead pastor. We had less than 300 people coming to the church. We had no more than $15,000 in the bank account. We had no this was crazy. This was not a, oh, we can see this happening down the road. We were in a converted grocery store that we had just paid off and we're just trying to hire people. And God gave me a vision of the future. And um, I honestly forgot about it because the only instruction he gave me is when you get to a thousand people, begin to pursue this. Well, with them 300 people that kept coming and leaving, I, I thought we were gonna be there forever. And, and, and literally, I, I began to go through this process of just pastoring and holding on to what God said. I told my mom, I told my wife, told one other person. And it's very important who you tell when God gives you a faith dream, when he gives you a faith, because some people would have killed it. They all looked at me a little crazy, but they didn't, they didn't shoot my, uh, my faith down. And when this relationship goals thing started moving, 
People started finding out about the church. People started driving from neighboring cities to come to our church. We went from, in 2018, we went from one service to five services in that location. It about killed me. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, we were preaching and people were coming in. It was lined up back on the highway. We had cops, people parking in the grass, parking down neighborhoods. It was just crazy. And I'm like, what is going on? I said, God, I need another building. God, show me what we need to do. He said, I already gave you the plan. Oh my gosh. And I said, you already gave the plan. Could you tell me again? Send the email again, because I, I don't, I don't, and I totally forgot about it. And one day in prayer, I, so strongly, Holy Spirit said, I gave you the plan in Bella's room. And I had, I had forgot about it, and I was like, hold on, I remember I did a document, and I had to search a different hard drive, and this thing came up, and as soon as I saw it, I mean, the Spirit of God welled up on the inside of me in faith. I called my mom. I said, I know what we're supposed to do. I need you to agree in prayer with me. We were looking at different buildings and old Kmarts and old Sears buildings and said, I'm done with the poles. I, I don't want no more poles because this has to be a place where we can film and, and be. I, I just saw all this because God gave it to me when we had nothing. Yeah. I come to the building. I said, get me a meeting with the people. And they said, it's not for sale. God, um, <laughs> I thought you just told me that I'm supposed to. Uh, and he said, believe my word. I want you to walk in crazy faith. I want you to believe me, even if it doesn't look like it. And when I tell you, we begin a process of what I thought at the moment was a setback, it was a setup. In this moment where we couldn't get in the building, more people were coming, more people were donating, more people were being a part, and it was giving us the resources to when God did open up the building, we would be able to step right into it. I can't um, um, tell you how excited I was the day they told me they were closing on the building, and 10 minutes after they started the closing, the funding fell through with the company that they were closing on. And because we had been persistent in asking them every week, is it available today? I mean, we were just, like just persistent in prayer and persistent in our pursuit. And they called us. And that was on a Monday. Me and the team came over here. We walked the building and said, everything look okay, huh? Does everything look okay? And, 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 and more than did it look okay, I already knew what God had yeah. said. Yeah. It wasn't even if I knew that everything was right and everything, I knew what God had said. And he had opened the door. We put the earnest money down on a Tuesday. The people who had um, um, been in negotiations came back with full funding on Friday, but they couldn't get it because we already had it tied Come up. Come on now. And, they, and this is the crazy thing about it. It even gets crazier. The man that wanted to buy the building came to me and said, I'll give you a million dollars to walk away from it. And I said, no, nah, man, I got a word from God. Yeah. He said, I'll give you a million dollars in free usage of the auditorium for five years if you walk away from it. I said, man, I really think that we're supposed to have it. He said, two million. I said, well, um, <laughs> let me think about that, you know. But then I told him, I said, no, I said, if, if you want it that bad and God gave me a word, I know we're supposed to own it for the kingdom of God. And at that moment, um, we begin that process. We told our church, and uh, I did this whole thing. I got the keys, the keys, the keys, and we begin to shout in victory. We put $6 million down on this building that was built for $54 million, 975 car garage. Pastor Mike, why are you saying the numbers? Because I want you to know how impossible this yeah, was. Right. Yeah. Like, I want right. you to know how unlikely this was for us. We bought the building for $10.5 million. They put a brand new roof on the whole thing Come before on, they man. gave it to us. They fixed stuff. They gave us $2 million of furniture, TVs, and everything that came with the building. And we were able to move into this building in September 2019, paid it off in December 2019. So in five months, we paid the whole building off and were able to burn the mortgage at our church anniversary to the glory of God. Hi. Come on now. Yeah, I can, I can tell, you know, interesting thing. I, I, I love the idea that your due diligence on buying this monstrous facility was basically walking in and walking back out and putting the money down the next day. Love that. Um, and Crazy faith. All I know is you have a really great lobby. When we put your television signal into what we call our playout facility and hit play, it hits a whole bunch of satellites. It goes over the two big oceans by fiber, by all sorts of stuff. And people in Africa are watching, wow. people in Europe are watching, people in Asia are watching, people in India are watching, South, Central America. And we just know 
that this kind of thing is speaking to people literally all over the world. Lord Everyone wants to have impact for the kingdom. And if they're chasing the wrong thing, mm. they're, not gonna, they're not gonna get there. Yes, sir. This was given to you by God and now we're sitting here. Yes, sir. Okay, so that was, that was March, March 9th, 9th 2015. And now we are sitting in the lobby of that building and uh, your testimony is hit another phase. You've hit another milestone in your, in your road. But I love what I've heard. I've heard for the last 30 to 40 years, hmm. God has been grooming me for this. Oh, yeah. And, and all the steps along the way. It's so funny. I was sitting with all the kids last night at dinner, hmm. and I said it might take decades before you know why something happened. You know, so don't ever, don't ever get weary in well-doing. Yes, God will do something. And, and your lack of wanting or needing all hmm. this and, and your faithful steps of obedience along the way that's few and far between yeah, yeah. the people you're, that do that. But I know that there's so many people yearning for that. There's so many Mike Todd's out there mm. watching that, that don't need a limelight, but have a, something on the inside, yeah, just yeah. like you did. The, the encouragement that I would give them is be faithful in what is before you today, mm. yeah. because it opens the door for tomorrow. And most people are looking at tomorrow enduring today. Like, I want that, and so I got to do this. Instead of I'm fully focused on this, and God's got that. And I believe that is why my mantra is over and over, all you have is all you need. God knew we didn't need a professional website. He just knew we needed YouTube. And so that's all we had. And from that moment. And cameras. And cameras. <laughs> but, but, but do you see what I'm saying? Like yeah. every step of the way, now God knows for what if wanted, we needed all of this. Right. We didn't have an LED light on our phone <laughs> four years ago. And yes. now we're sitting in the lobby of the church with LEDs everywhere because he knew how I needed to present the gospel for where he was taking it. We didn't have it until we needed it. And I just would encourage people right now, if you're serving that youth group or serving in that, that um, um, senior citizen's home, or if you're serving your family, or if you're serving um, the vision God's called you to do and you don't see the progress yet, it's okay. God's got tomorrow. You got to work today. Like if you work today and you're faithful over today and you pray over today and you find joy in today, the, the God says the birds don't worry about tomorrow. It got enough worries of itself, but be focused right here and today. And I just want to let everybody know that our faith today matters to God. And I'm sitting here with you guys, and I've seen tons of interviews y'all have done with all kinds of people. I'm kind of in an out-of-body experience at this moment <laughs> because I never dreamed of being here, but God knew I would be here. Uh, I remind you, we've been after you for a while. So uh, there's, I'm just yeah, you saying. Been yeah, you could have been sitting here a while, okay. while ago. Yeah. Could have been here a while ago. We're with Michael Todd. Not only Love did it. this book go to the New York Times number one bestseller, it's brand new companion book. So I want to jump into a theology thing. We were watching a video and you said something really interesting. You said he's called the Prince of Darkness. Okay, so Satan is the prince of darkness. And you said mm -hmm. the word darkness is ignorance. Mm -hmm. So he's the prince of ignorance. Mm. So good. <laughs> okay, I really like that. Yeah. Okay, so how do you, just, just preach your fourth sermon now on praise <laughs> and give us a little bit of where you were at and what you're talking about with Satan being the prince of ignorance. Well, I, I think the whole concept is that that's where everybody um, allows Satan to work the most mm -hmm. and where we are ignorant. There you go. When we do not know what God says about something, even if we know what culture says of it, about it or our family says about it, we are still ignorant because the ultimate truth is the word of God. And once we know what God says about marriage, what God says about how to raise a family, what God says about how to deal with finances, how to be generous, all that other stuff, that's when we get light knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the problem is the area 
that we are the most ignorant is the area that the devil has the most control. And that's why when we talk about race, there's people who are ignorant in that, and that's why the enemy can come in and divide nations and divide businesses. When people are ignorant on what God says about um, resources and stewardship, that's where the enemy is able to bring people. When people don't know that they're actually loved by God, then they start going and searching for um, um, comfort in Richard and then Ricardo and then Ronaldo and then, and then everybody else. It's because they're ignorant. And that's where the enemy is able. And that's why I believe it's so important for me to bring the light or God's word, the gospel to every situation, not just um, the things that we're used to talking about in church. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen a transformation church um, um, service or experienced it live, we talk about everything. <laughs> everything from pornography to what God says to do with finances, to um, me having cheated on my soon-to-be wife before we got married, to healing, to deliverance, to prophecy. Why? Because it all matters. Yeah. Because we're all walking through it. And we need Christ, His light, His knowledge in the middle of it because that makes the enemy powerless. Because yeah. He's only strong where we're ignorant. New question. That so was your good. that was your fourth so sermon. Um, here's a new one. When Jesus said on the cross, "It is finished." Yes, sir. What did he finish? He finished in my um, um, ex exposition of the word. He finished what God purposed for him to come to Earth to do, to give us an opportunity to get back in right relationship with God. Okay. He finished the opportunity. Like he said, it is, do you know Jesus died on a maybe? Like there was no guarantee that people would accept him. Wow. He did it for just the opportunity that somebody could be made right with God. Oh, my goodness. And for me, the reason why that's so important is because I was raised in church. I have amazing parents, but I chose a lot of wrong things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was addicted to pornography. I was a liar. I was a manipulator. I had a, a potentially felony case for it, car insurance fraud. This ain't decades ago. This is like in the last 10 years. Like there were all kinds of things. Not while you've been senior pastor. Though. Not senior okay, pastor, okay. but youth pastor. I ain't, gonna, ain't no shame in my game. Like, like I'm, I'm telling you, the reason why I'm this authentic is because God doesn't bless who you pretend to be. Right. Come on now. He blesses who you really there are. You are. And there are so many people out here and so many people that might be watching me that you think that God's in the facade, but he's in the real you. He only wants to bless you from where you are right now. And even though it may be ugly to other people, when I had to stand before my church as a youth pastor and say I made a mistake, I got in an accident, and I tried to call Geico 15 minutes or less, and it almost cost me 15 years or more. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I had to get up. I had to own it because it doesn't take away the consequences, but right. God's grace will allow you to not have to suffer under the shame and the guilt of that thing. And it used that moment. I preached the message, locked up. They won't let me out. And I talked about the grace of God. God wants to use everything. Yes. Yes. Come on now. If you would be authentic and actually use so it. So good. The Bible says we overcome him, the enemy, the prince of ignorance and darkness. By what? The blood of the lamb. That's what Jesus did on the cross. But the words of our actual testimony, not the fake one you made up, not the one you post on Instagram or Facebook, but what really happened. And I believe that's why God is blessing this ministry. Jesus said, I've come to seek and save the lost. Yep. He said, I've come to destroy the works of the devil. On the cross, he said, it's finished. Yep. If the devil is defeated mm -hmm. by Jesus and he has the redemptive work is complete, why do we in 2021 blame the devil for anything? <laughs> the problem with this is the victory is ours if we show up for the fight. And the problem is there are too many believers that have left the belt unclaimed. Okay. It, step into the ring. Yeah. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Yeah. When you stand up in the name of Jesus, you have already been given the victory, all the enemy can do is bark like he won, but he has no teeth. You ever met a dog that <laughs> and it'll scare a lot of people right. until somebody is brave enough to step on that puppy 
and say, come here. And then he's just, oh, rrr, rrr, <laughs> just uh, that is what has happened in the great story of humanity where God has come in and rescued us, mm. won the ultimate victory. And the devil's still barking and suggesting and trying to say, but if you would just stand up, the victory is already ours. We have already won the victory. And that's what I encourage people to do, yeah. to stand up in the victory yeah. that God has already won for us and claim that Jesus Christ is Lord. We like to say, we don't pray for victory, we pray it's from, from victory. Come on. And, and when, when, when Jesus was basically, you know, in his ministry, when he was finishing his ministry, when he was on the cross, it, it, it almost feels like some people, if you don't know anything about Jesus, you're lost. Yeah. If you know about Jesus as the redeemer and accept that, you can be redeemed. If you know about Jesus who said, by my stripes you're healed, or the Isaiah said yeah. it and prophesying about Jesus. And, and so if you don't know that Jesus heals, if you didn't know, you know, think of the stories in the, in the book of Acts. We know of the baptism of John. We know of the baptism of Jesus. We don't know about this baptism of the Holy Spirit. We don't know about that one. Tell us that one, see? So it's what you know. It's that and ignorance thing. It's <laughs> the, it, you know, you'll know the truth. The truth, the will, truth will make you free. Yeah. If you don't know the truth. That's, you, that's why I feel like where God has positioned me um, in the body of Christ today, in the small sliver that I play, is to represent God, to lost people and found people so they can be transformed in Christ. I want to talk to the guy who's never set foot in church and can't stand the idea of being controlled and let him know that God loves him so much. And I want to go to the mother of the church that's been there for 45 years, that has been stagnant in her walk with God to be able to become alive again and be able to do the things that God has purposed for them. We have the greatest story ever told yeah. and we gotta tell it again and again and again because more people need to know what Christ has done, how it affects them and how it can affect them for generations to come. Mm. We're sitting here today because of what your parents knew, mm. what my parents knew yeah. and what they gave to us. And so I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell the whole world until I can't speak. <laughs> it feels like uh, one of the main themes uh, that we're kind of hitting on here, even though we're kind of moving around doing stuff, is one of the themes that relationships can't be right until you have one relationship correct. Yeah, I, I tell people all the time. I said that all of our relationships need to be um, certified by the manufacturer. Um, there is one who came into relationship with himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and said, let us make man in our image. And then the two became one. And all of these things that we see about relationship were made by a manufacturer. I have an iPhone. If my iPhone breaks, I don't go to Honda to fix it. Right. Because Honda did not manufacture my iPhone. And it's so crazy that in today's society, we all have relationships, but we try to go to reality TV to fix it. We try to go to culture to fix it. We try to go, but I'm saying, let's go back to the originator of all our relationships. So let's aim at a relationship with him and make that a goal. And out of that relationship, all our other relationships will actually be able to win in. And that's why I'm telling people we got to help them win in relationships. <clears throat> Those that are viewing right now that you just spoke to some of them, the the, the guy that doesn't ever want to walk in church, there's, there's a lot of people that stopped and, and is going, this, this young man's got something to say here. The, the idea that there are people viewing now that need that one relationship right. Why don't you look at them and explain that to them and lead people to Jesus? So, so the thing that you need to know is that I'm sitting here as a flawed man. I'm sitting here as somebody that has experienced the grace of God. I was a liar, a manipulator, addicted to pornography. I had a lot of dark things in my heart. And this is not a long time ago. I never wanted to be a pastor. God saw my purpose and he said, with all of that, I'll still use you. 
He, he literally saw my flaws and he said, I can deal with that. I know what religion tells you to quit all the habits and then come to God. But what God says is give me your heart and I'll help you change the habits. Today, I am inviting you into the one thing that transformed my life. It's the thing that took me from being a person that was horrible to a person that is healing, from a person that was concerned with perfection and now a person that is only concerned with progression. Today, what God wants to do is come into your life and transform you. And if for no other reason that you're watching this, today is your day of salvation. It's not tomorrow, that's not promised to us. But right now in this moment, I feel the power of God coming to invade your home. This is not an accident, this is a setup. And I'm telling you, when you invite Jesus into your life, it transforms you from the inside out. This will be your best year ever if it is your best year spiritually. And God's saying, let me come in and help you. And right now there are people that are broken and hurting and maybe you've been with God for a while and you're saying, but I need a fresh fire. This is for you too right now in this moment. Right now, I want you to just lift your hands all over the world, wherever you're watching this. There is no distance in what God's about to do. He's right there with you right now. And if you wanna pray this prayer of salvation, I want you to repeat after me. And as a matter of fact, I want everybody to say it for the benefit of those who are coming to Christ. We're a family here at TBN and we wanna see God do something so miraculous in our lives. Come on, let's pray together. Somebody say, God. God. Thank you. Thank you. For sending Jesus. For sending Jesus. Just for me. Just for me. Today, Today, I know. I know. I need a savior. I need a savior. And I choose you. And I choose you. I believe you lived. I believe you lived. You died. You died. And you rose again. You rose again. Just for me. Just for me. So change me. Change. Renew me. Renew me. Transform me. Transform. Me. I'm yours. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we give God some praise oh, right now? I want to let you know that all of heaven is rejoicing over one person that made that decision. This is not about us just counting you as a number. This is that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I'm telling you that everything in your world is about to transform. Pray for people's relationships. Yes, sir. And and healing for people. I feel that. Come on now. Father, in the name Jesus. of Jesus, we pray for every person who is dealing with the relational tension, trauma, or stronghold, Father God. There are people that have been trapped in situations that, Father God, have literally been trying to take them out. And Father, there are people that there needs to be healing so that love can come back into Thank their you, relationships. Lord. We're not just talking about romantic relationships, God, but we're talking about relationships between mother and father, mother and son, and, 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 and daughter and father, Father God, family relationship. God, I'm asking you for coworkers and business partners, God. I'm asking you that you are the God that will show us how to do relationships well. Father, let us go back to your word, which is the manual to life. That is the truth. And Father, let us get light or knowledge in every area of what your word says. Father, I thank you that forgiveness will begin to run rampant in relationships in the name of Jesus. Father, that you would bring people into divine humility. Father God, that the only way we can have successful relationships is walking humbly in meekness, Father God. And I'm thank asking you, you, as we sit in this moment, that you are bringing back to people's minds right now what they need to do, who they need to talk to, what needs to be said, and who they need to let go. I'm praying for a divine release. Thank you, Lord. That people will begin to release the offense, begin to Thank release you, the pressure, begin to release, Father God, all of the ops that have been held. And God, I'm asking you to do a healing work from the inside out. Do it on the heart level. Do it on the soul level. Thank you, Lord. The mind, the will, and the emotions. Father, if it doesn't show up on Instagram or Facebook, Father, let it show up in us, Father God. And I'm thanking you that you would do a major work in the lives and let you and your love be our number one relationship goal. And I thank you out of that, everything else would flow. In Jesus' name, we agree. Amen. Amen.